Thank you for joining us for Sermons on Demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. We provide these videos as a way to share the pulpit messages and teachings offered at Friendship Grace Brethren Church. If you find these videos a helpful resource, please drop us a note at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com. Now open your Bibles and get ready to dig into the Word of God. Okay, we are in back in the book of Acts this morning. We are in chapter 16, and we're going to pick up our, our study in uh, verse 35. We are uh, in the middle of the section on the conflicts in Macedonia. To help you get, a, get your bearing again, I know it's been a couple of weeks since we've been in Acts. So we're going to pick up the story in Acts chapter 16, verse 35. But when it was day, the magistrate sent the police saying, let, these, let those men go. And the jailer reported these words to Paul saying that the magistrates have sent you, or have, have sent to let you go, therefore come out now and go in peace. So remember the, uh, this, the situation there. They're in Philippi and uh, they were arrested and uh, they were in jail and singing and the little bit of earthquake and the jail doors opened and the chains fell off and they came out and We don't know why the magistrates ordered the release of Paul and Silas at this point. We don't know what the deal was. Um, it may have been because they only wanted to teach them a lesson by beating them and keeping them overnight in jail. It also may have been that they heard about the situation in the jail and the earthquake. And at this point, we just don't we don't know why they were released. Just that they were released. I think that there probably is some uh, indication that they they recognize Paul as being a citizen of Rome and there were very strict laws about how you could uh, incarcerate citizens Roman citizens and what they had done to Paul and Silas Paul and uh, Silas was not in keeping with with um, the the arrest of a Roman citizen so the jailer attempts to send them on their way, but it didn't quite go as expected. Look at verse 37. But Paul said to them, They have beaten us publicly, uncondemned men who are Roman citizens, and have thrown us into prison, and they now throw us out. And do they now throw us out secretly? No, let them come themselves and take us out. Now, I want you to think about that statement for, for just a moment before we go on. He's just been told he's free from prison but he says no they arrested us and and imprisoned us secretly those guys can come and tell us to our face he's pretty bold at this point and he is he is uh, he's making sure that they understand this didn't go the way it was supposed to that's why I think because he says who are Roman citizens, that's why I think this is all about being Roman citizens. The police reported these words to the magistrates and they were afraid when they heard that they were Roman citizens. So they came and apologized to them and they took them out and asked them to leave the city. So they went out of the prison and visited Lydia and when they had seen the brothers, they encouraged them and departed. Paul uh, discloses something to the cops that must have been a, sent a chill up their spine. He told them that they were Roman citizens. So I've kind of answered this for you. Why would, they, why would that scare the cops? Because it was against the law for a Roman citizen to be arrested like that and then beaten. Severe penalties were, uh, were in store for, uh, for the, uh, the, the soldiers that arrested and beat the citizen. Paul was not going to be beaten and thrown in prison, excuse me, without the proper trial and then just released and sent out of town. If the magistrates wanted them released, Paul needed, Paul uh, said to them, they need to come down and release them personally. They were going to have to show everyone what they had done. 
So the second question is, why would Paul demand the magistrates personally escort them out of town? Yeah, I think so. And I think to make the magistrates take ownership for what they had done. They, Romans. Yeah, they were, they were like the judges. Yeah, yeah, the Roman, the Roman authorities in town that had the, had the authority to put them in jail or release them from jail. I think Paul really wanted them to, uh, to take ownership of that. To accept the fact that they had done what they shouldn't have done. Also in verse 40, we see an end to this first we section in Acts. Remember, the we sections are, are, uh, are uh, accounts where Dr. Luke is present, and he writes in the first person. Well, that comes to an end now in verse 40. He apparently doesn't travel on with, uh, with Paul um, afterwards as we move into Acts chapter 17. Now, this is 17 verse 1. Now when they had passed, notice, now when they had passed through uh, Amphipolis and Apollonia, Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. It's about 100 miles from Philippi to Thessalonica, and uh, Amphipolis and Apollonia were about 30 miles apart along the way, so they, you know, they were walking a little ways and it'd come to a, a rest stop walking a ways come to the rest stop and so forth all, along the way it was actually a fairly nice nice journey on on Roman roads and Paul went in and was as his custom and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the scriptures so Paul's there at least three weeks now and he went into the Sabbath or into the synagogue on the Sabbath and spoke to them from the scriptures. What's that mean? What's it mean from the scriptures? Torah, yeah. From all of the Old Testament, yeah. All of it. Yeah, yeah. Who can remember, we, we saw this on Wednesday night, who can remember what all of that was called? Well, you weren't here Wednesday night. Shame on you. Tanakh. And it's called Tanakh, why? The, the, the names for the sections, the, the law, the prophets, and the, and the wisdom, or the writings, Nevi'im, yeah. uh, forms the acronym Tanakh. And it was all accepted, and it was all, it was all accept, uh, accessible to them. But it was not in Hebrew, it was in Greek. Because by the time of Jesus, the popular version for for the Jews in Israel of the scriptures to read was the Septuagint was the Greek translation of the Old Testament and so they had they they were reading Greek and I would add they were reading a less than stellar translation of the Hebrew um, uh, there's there are a couple of groups that in the, in the period of time after the Babylonian captivity, after the release of that, um, a lot of folks believe that the Essenes in Qumran, where all the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, were, were part of the, the translation group. But it was a work that was in progress at the end of the, United Mon or at the, end of the divided monarchy when, when the... Uh, when the uh, captivity in, in uh, 586 happened. It was already in process. Sort of. Not, not, not well, but during the intervening time, you have, you have the Maccabees that, that controlled for a little while. They were big into translation. And you have the, uh, the Essenes in Qumran that were big into translation and copying. Um, it was the standard 
for, uh, for Jewish teachers was the Greek version of the Old Testament, the Septuagint. Septuagint didn't handle numbers well. You could read in the Septuagint um, a number that's supposed to be a thousand and it may be ten thousand or a hundred thousand. And so we have some introduced errors in, in the copies of Scripture because the Septuagint didn't handle some things well. But that was the standard text that was being used by folks during, during that period of time. Mm -hmm. they didn't want to give up they had to give up because most of them no longer could even speak Hebrew they, the, their, their regular language their, their day to day uh, personal language at home was Aramaic it wasn't Hebrew Hebrew had by, by the end of the, of the captivity Hebrew had been uh, had been set to be just the, the worship language, basically, which forced them then into, into translations. And because, because Alexander the Great had, had, had driven Greek ideology and Greek language so far, it became the standard. But what they spoke at home was Aramaic. They spoke Hebrew only in, in the synagogue or the, in, the, uh, um, in the temple. And uh, Greek became the language that they, they traded with. Now, Greek is not because of the Romans. The Romans didn't speak good Greek. They spoke Latin. Well, a pre-version of Latin. No, you, if you know Latin today, you wouldn't be able to speak the Latin then. But they, that's what they spoke. But because Rome took over a, a territory occupied by Greece, Greek still became the, the predominant trade language for for most of, of the uh, European Asia Minor world. Yeah, they were way smarter than us. Yeah, they at least had to know two. Now, most of them could not write. They couldn't read or write. So that was not the that was not a, a situation that they had to learn how to do that. They just had to learn how to speak it. Yeah. What's that? Just by hearing. Yeah. Yeah. Just like a baby does. So, on to verse 3, explaining and proving that was necessary for Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead in saying that this Jesus, whom I proclaim to you, is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas and, and did many, as did a great many of the devout Greeks and now a few of the leading, and not a few of the leading women. Be better if I could read. So, here's a question just before I answer it for you. Explain what Paul means by the Christ had to suffer and to rise from the dead. And he's speaking to Jews in the synagogue. What does he mean that the Christ had to suffer and to rise from the dead? Well... Yeah, but I'm focusing on the words the the Christ had to suffer. Yeah, really. Yes, and it was prophesied in the Old Testament because. That's circular reasoning. <laughs> well, here's the deal. God chose us to be saved before the foundation of the world. He had already set in motion the plan. And the only way, you, sh you guys should know this, the only way that we could be saved, the Jews were, were every year sending a sacrifice 
to appease God, but the only way that we could give, be given eternal life was for somebody of enough value and that was human paid the price. Well, who's of enough value to pay the price for all of man's sin? A God, right? Only God. Because we can pay for our own price, but it'll take us eternity to pay the price. And so to compound that, you need somebody that's, uh, that is human because it was a human sin, but of enough value, and so it was God. And so when Paul, when Paul is beginning this to, to articulate the theology, as, as Chuck had said, soteriology, the, the study of uh, salvation, the Christ, what, it, what, is that, what does that mean? Why, why the definite article, the Christ? Christ is what? Messiah. So he's writing, talking to Jews, and he says the Messiah had to come, suffer and die, and rise from the dead, so that salvation could actually be obtainable. So that God had a legal right to do this. We, we, have, we have convinced ourselves, I, we haven't, but the world, or theologians before us have convinced us that God can do anything. That's not a true statement. God can't violate his own character. And as a just and holy God, he couldn't just arbitrarily forgive sin. Something had to pay the price, the penalty for the sin. And so it took the death of Jesus in order to do that. That's what Paul is beginning to articulate in that. The Messiah to be born had to be more than a conquering king. He also had to be a suffering ser servant. Both pictured in the Old Testament, but the Jews only recognized, they only wanted to see the, con the conquering king. As a result of the ministry of Paul and company in Thessalonica, many Jews were saved along with a large group of Gentiles who already feared God. Or feared God. They, were, they were Gentiles that were going to the only place where they could hear at least something about Jehovah God. They weren't be necessarily becoming Jews. They were just interested in Jehovah, and so they were going there so they could, they could learn about that. But the Jews were jealous, and taking some wicked men of the rabble, I love that description, they formed a mob, set the city in an uproar, and attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring them out to the crowd. So what did the Jews have to be jealous about? Yeah, go back to... Some of them were persuaded, that some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, and a great many of the devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women. So a bunch of people, a bunch of apparently important people, we're beginning to be connected to this, to what Paul and Silas were teaching. And why would that be a problem for the Jews? I've got to wake you guys up somehow. Exactly. That's right. They would lose power, they'd lose control, and that meant they would lose what? Money. Money. Yeah. That's what it's all about. And when they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authorities, shouting, these men who have turned the world upside down have come also. I love that. Wouldn't that be a cool thing to have said about your church? You turned the world upside down. And Jason has received them, and they are all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying there is another king, Jesus. So when the mob couldn't find Paul and his team, they went after Jason, who was hosting the team. Jason and some of the other believers were arrested and taken before the city officials, the charge against Jason was that he was harboring, harboring men who were causing trouble all over the world. 
They also accused Paul of acting against Caesar in his decrees by naming Jesus as king. So, was the charge against Paul a valid charge? Why or why not? Yeah, absolutely it was a valid charge. He was guilty. And in according to Roman law, he was guilty of treason. By this time, by 40, 50 AD, the Roman Republic had become the Roman Empire. Once the, the, leading, the, the leader of the Roman Empire was named Caesar, they became demigods. That means that they were worshipped just like the other pantheon of gods that they had in the Roman mythology system. And to say anybody had more authority than Caesar was a capital crime. It was treason. So it was absolutely a valid charge against Paul. And one that I think he gladly accepted. And the people in the city authorities were disturbed when they heard these things. And when they had taken money as security from Jason and the rest, they let him go. So they took a bond from Jason. They fined him. Luke makes an interesting statement in verse 8. The English word confusion, look again at, eight, at, at verse 8, and the people in the city were disturbed. In the Net Bible, that disturbed is confused or confusion. Um, the English word confusion is the Greek word uh, ex, uh, ataxaran, ataxan, ataxan, which means to cause confusion. How Luke meant this statement is not certain. The city officials may have been confused or upset that Paul and his team were not captured um, to be warned or thrown out of the city. There are also some scholars who believe it was the crowd that was confused or upset because of how Jason and some of the Christians were treated. However, what is known is that Paul's ministry in Thessalonica caused a great deal of activity and for many confusion. Satan appears to be working hard to prevent the spread of the gospel. The brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea, and when they arrived, they went into the Jewish synagogue. So, escaping the problems in Thessalonica, Paul and Silas go to, to Berea. Um, they traveled again to Berea in the synagogue, and while Timothy is not mentioned in this verse, he shows up in Berea in verse 14. He may have traveled with Paul and Silas. He may have already gone, uh, been gone from Thessalonica when the problems began, and Luke doesn't, doesn't tell us. Timothy was there. He shows up later. So somehow he gets there, but isn't mentioned in this particular story. Now these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. This is my favorite part of the book of Acts. What does verse 11 mean? Now these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. What does that mean? Yeah. And what? Yep. They examine the scriptures. So Paul is... Now, now think about the difficulty of what they're doing. They didn't yet have the New Testament. So Paul is saying that Jesus had to suffer and die and be raised. And I'm, I'm, we're assuming that the same message he was preaching in, in Berea. And they were looking at the scriptures, Old Testament, to see if those things were so. That's a tough task. Just think about it. You, you all have read through the Old Testament a few times. Think about the task of examining 
whether or not Paul was giving you the straight poop. That'd be a big deal. That's some full contact uh, discussion there. Right? Because the Jews, they were all focused on the, on the conquering king. And they weren't focused on the, the minor side of what the Old Testament described as the suffering king. The suffering Messiah. So that was a, that was a big deal. But they did it. They studied and they, they showed themselves to be worthy of that. Many of them therefore believed in, with not a few Greek women of high standing as well as men. On to verse 13. But when the Jews from Thessalonica learned that the word of God was proclaimed by Paul at Berea also, they came there too, agitating and stirring up the crowds. Then the brothers immediately sent Paul off on his way to the sea, but Silas and Timothy remained there. Those who conducted Paul brought him as far as Athens, and after receiving a command from Silas and Timothy to come to him as soon as possible, they departed. So the Jews from Thessalonica heard that Paul and team were having some success in Berea as well, so they traveled to Berea to stir up things against Paul as they had done in Thessalonica. This again forced Paul to hit the trail and, and evacuate. However, this time Silas and Timothy remained in Berea. Paul was escorted as far as Athens. Which brings us to a conclusion of our, of our section on uh, the conflicts in... Uh, oh, I forget what it is. Conflicts in what? Macedonia, I think. Is that right? Conflicts in Macedonia? I can't remember that far back. What's my name? Conflicts in Macedonia. And now we move into the crusade in Achaia. Okay? Chapter 17, verse 16. Now when Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. This verse illustrates the depth of love that Paul had for unbelievers. He re recognized their depravity in the Greek polytheistic world. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. In keeping with his normal procedures, Paul went first to the synagogue to preach. Why well, go first to the synagogue, especially in Athens where there's so many other places of worship? It's custom, but why? Exactly. That's half of it. Because the gospel is given to the Jews first and then to, to the Gentiles, as Paul would say. But he goes to a place where people are already at least kind of receptive to the idea of the Messiah. He just needs to introduce them to the Messiah. See, he, he was a Jew. He loved the Jews. And he wanted the Jews to have the message as well. The marketplace, or agora, Paul would encounter the center of Athenian life. Besides being the place of trade for the various shops and peddlers, it was also the cultural center of the town. The philosophers would debate there and present their few views of life there. Luke records that Paul would address or reason with the philosophers that were there. They would present their side and he would present... He would respond and present his, excuse me, his possessions, his, uh, positions. So that sets up the next verse. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers, two different philosophical camps, kind of diametrically opposed from each other, okay? Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also con conversed with him. And some said, what does this babbler wish to say. Others said he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. The primary challengers to Paul's messages were philosophers 
who followed the Epicurean way or philosophers who followed the Stoic way, both well-known Greek philosophic systems. The Epicureans followed Epicurus, who lived at the height of the Greek philosophical development from 341 to 270 BC. His worldview basically held that the chief end of man was pleasure and happiness. To, to arrive at this pleasure and happiness, man had to avoid the fear of death, seek tranquility, and the freedom from pain. I would be all about seeking freedom from pain. Epicureans also believed that if gods existed, they did not get involved with the affairs of men. So think about, think about that philosophical worldview. It's all about being ha or having pleasure, not being afraid of anything, and if there are gods, they don't get involved with us. Okay? That's basically the Epicurean way. The Stoics were followers of the philosopher Zeno, who had lived at the height of the Greek philosophical development. He lived from 320 to 250 BC. The name Stoic comes from the location the group met in the painted portico, or Stoa, in Athens. The Stoics were pantheistic, meaning they saw that everything that existed, um, that existed was made up, made up God. Everything, God is everything, okay? Um, they taught that man's main purpose was to direct history. Stoics were prideful and believed themselves to be self-sufficient, not in need of anything or anyone. So neither of these, of these philosophical camps that Paul is debating with were inclined to necessarily follow and worship gods. Okay? The English Standard Version, ESV, the word uh, conversed leaves a little out of what was going on. Conversed in the Greek is the word synbalon, which means debate, ponder, throw together, think about seriously. Paul debated with these philosophers. I think this is the first true use of apologetics in Scripture. Babbler is the Greek word spermologos, which literally means seed picker. And it's used in a way to, to say that he cherry-picked the things that he wanted to believe, that he didn't have a solid framework. The idea that one picks up bits and pieces of knowledge all over the place. In other words, one who has no system but lots of bits of knowledge. The Epicureans and the Stoics thought that Paul had no system of philosophy or theology, just unrelated bits and pieces. Some others also saw he was proclaiming a God foreign to them, and they wanted to know more. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, Men, we know what this new teaching, uh, we know what this new teaching is that you are May we know, well, if I could read, I'd be dangerous, wouldn't I? May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting. For you being some strange, bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now, all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. It's almost a sad commentary on life, isn't it? So Paul was invited to speak at the Areopagus, or in Athens, the Hill of Areas. Um, it was a meeting place of the Council of the Areopagus, which was the supreme body for the judicial and legislative matters in Athens. At the height of Greek power, the Areopagus had control over every part of Greek life. Now under Roman rule, it simply had oversight over religion and education. But this is where you went. This is where all the brain, this was the brain trust of, of Athens, which was the center of Greek philosophical uh, understanding. The council wanted to know about his, this new teaching that Paul had been presenting. They thought it strange to their, to their ears. 
<coughs> there was a real love of debate in Athens, and an openness of the council gave Paul a tremendous opportunity to present the gospel to people who wanted to know more. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in, any, in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. What a stroke of genius. He's in a town that has idols and everything all over the place, and they're so afraid they're going to miss a God, they have one called the unknown God. Just in case we missed one. And Paul says, look, I saw, your, I saw your idol to the unknown God. Well, let me introduce you to him. He won't be unknown after this. I think that was a, a stroke of genius. Unobserved to the English reader, Paul, Paul uses carefully chosen words to refer, refer to the Greek gods, that the council would be directed to the Greek gods. But at the same time, Paul was casting them in demonic light. We don't see it in our English text. The English phrase, very religious, is made up of the Greek word, and I'm not even going to get it. Wow, holy, holy cow. Well, it's almost that. It's uh, de isa demonstrous which is a compound word which means to fear or revere deities or evil spirits very firmly. The thought Paul was presenting is that the Athenians were very firm in their worship of gods, and he hinted that these gods were actually demonic in origin. Paul also spoke about the idol to the unknown gods. The Athenians had erected this idol over the fear of potentially missing a god. When Paul spoke of the unknown god, his emphasis was not on the worship of it, but on their ignorance of the true god. So here's part of Paul's message. The god who made the world and everything in it, being lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything since he himself gives all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him, yet he, he, he is actually not far from each of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, and even as some of our own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance, the times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. Because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed, and of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. After Paul introduced them to the unknown God, the one true God, he then began to explain to them who the one true God is and what he has done. He's not like the other gods, made with human hands, and he needs nothing from the hands of man. The concept that concept would appeal to the Epicureans who believed God did not interact with humanity. Paul then makes a statement that would appeal to the Stoics. He gives life and breath to everything, to everyone. Um, the Stoics would like that statement because they thought they, they were to align themselves with the purpose of the cosmos. Paul began his interaction with the Areopagus right where they were intellectually and philosophically. Right on their own level and right at their own position. Paul refers back to Adam as the original man from whom all nations came. He also states that God has control over how long they live, where they live. The sovereign God has declared his omnipotence, the history of the world, 
before it has occurred. Paul also declares that God's purpose in declaring history and revealing himself in creation is so that he will search for him. Even though God is sovereign and transcendent from the world, he is also approachable and knowable. I would add that Paul would later go on to say that we only search for him when he calls us to search for him, when he, when he empowers us to search for him. Paul then quotes some Greek poets uh, the Areopagus would have been familiar with. In these quotes, he was telling the Athenians that, that we're all from God. We move because God permits us, and we live because God gave us breath and life. No such claim could be made by any of the false gods the Greeks worshipped. Paul concluded that since God has made humans, God cannot possibly have been made by man. Paul says that God was, has overlooked the human ignorance of idol worship. This does not mean he, he will not punish idol worship, simply that he has not punished it immediately. The day of judgment is coming in which God will judge. The judgment will come through one man that has been authenticated and proven by being raised from the dead. There was nothing in any of the systems of Greek philosophy to compare to the resurrection of Jesus. It was completely incomparable. One of the major Greek philosophical systems wanted to get off, to, to get rid of their bodies, not have it raised from the dead. The Greeks also did not have a concept of personal judgment. They heard exactly what they needed to hear. Any questions? I love Paul's message there. I think that Paul's, the first time we have recorded in Scripture an apologetics type message was a, a resounding success. Questions? Comments? Thank you, Father, for allowing us to see Paul in action through Dr. Luke's history of what happened. That he went into a place where philosophy was being discussed and he used philosophical terms to introduce them to the unknown God. Father, that's our goal as well, that we introduce people to the God that they don't know, to you, and that you have an impact on their lives. Continue to put people in our, in our way to, to talk to and to reason with, and prepare us every day to be able to do that. Thank you for loving us. We look forward to the service to follow where you're honored and glorified in Jesus' name. Thank you for watching or listening to this teaching on demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. Please consider sending us an email at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com to let us know how this teaching may have helped you. Please also consider joining us in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church, located at 10251 Metro Parkway, Suite 116, Fort Myers, Florida, just south of the intersection of Metro and Colonial Boulevard. Sunday school begins at 9 and worship service at 10 a.m. We look forward to seeing you in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church.